knowledge has determining patent infringement, reasonable royalty damages. What lies ahead in 2018? I'm David Jennings. I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's panelists, Laura Smalley. She's a member of Harris Beach PLLC. She is a partner, and her practice is in the intellectual property, business, and commercial litigation and appellate practice groups. She's also a member of the firm's e-discovery practice and serves on the photonics industry team. Selected as one of the best lawyers in America, Laura focuses her legal practice on technology development and exploitation, including the enforcement of intellectual property rights. She also prosecutes patents in the chemical field. She's admitted to practice in the, before the U.S. PTO with a technical background in chemistry, including organic and analytical chemistry. Ms. Smalley has litigated several patent infringement suits involving medical devices, electronic components, and imaging technology. Laura also performs, performs appellate work in both New York State and federal appeals courts. Now, let's go to slide eight. I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter. She is a partner at Harris Beach. Here is Laura Smalley. Hi, and welcome to our program. Um, as noted before, um, I do patent litigation in the medical device, electronic components, imaging, and other fields. I'm going to be discussing current and future developments in reasonable royalty damages from the legal perspective. Next slide, please. Um, just as a background to start off our talk, the basic theory behind a reasonable royalty is set forth in the statute, Section 284. That section guarantees the patent owner damages adequate to compensate for the infringement in an amount no less than a reasonable royalty. In general, this means that the patent owner is always entitled to damages, but there have been cases where the damages ultimately awarded have been nominal. Nominal damages can result from the exclusion of expert testimony or the lack of competent proof of damages. So the guarantee in the statute does not necessarily mean that the patent owner will get a large damages award. That depends on the facts of the case, which you don't generally control, and the quality of proof, which you do. The general theory behind a reasonable royalty is to measure the value of what was taken, value the use of the patented technology. And despite some strict cases on what proof is required to prove a reasonable royalty, including cases requiring apportionment, the Federal Circuit has often stated that estimating a reasonable royalty is not an exact science. You can therefore arrive um, at sufficient proof of a reasonable royalty by various methods. The most important consideration is to have a sound economic basis and where there's case law saying that you have to take certain factors into account, such as the comparability of licenses or apportionment, make sure your expert addresses those issues and provides sufficient de detail in the expert report and in testimony to show that the factors were addressed rationally and deliberately. Next slide, please. A reasonable royalty generally ends up being one of two types. Recent case law have, has tended to focus on lump sum royalties, and lump sums are a fairly common award, particularly for infringement relating to software innovations and cell phone. And a lump sum um, is really, as it sounds, it's a sum of money rather than a per unit or use payment. The primary driver on whether a lump sum is awarded by the jury or the court is whether comparable licenses compensate the patent owner on a lump sum or running royalty basis. Um, and the Federal Circuit has noted that there are significant or significant differences may exist between a running royalty license and a sum, lump sum license, and those differences may render a prior license of one type incomparable for a hypothetical royalty of the other type. In the Lucent case, a Federal Circuit case from 2009, the Federal Circuit rejected four running royalty license agreements that were asserted as evidence of a hypothetical lump sum agreement, noting that the jury had almost no testimony with which to recalculate in a meaningful way the value of any of the running royalty agreements to arrive at a lump sum damages award. In a standard running royalty license, the amount of money payable by the licensee is directly tied to future use of the license invention. And this places a lot of risk on the licensor because it does not receive a guaranteed payment and the licensor generally has less control over the level of sales of the invention. On the other hand, a lump sum agreement enables the patentee to raise a substantial amount of cash quickly. A lump sum 
agreement can mitigate risks such as false or underreporting and provides administrative convenience. There will be little or no record keeping or audit issues. Choice of a reasonable royalty or lump sum when you're providing damages calculations for the court um, will depend on what the comparable license provide, licenses provide and to an extent um, industry practice. And I just want to note here before I go on that full citations for the court cases referenced on the slides or in my talk are listed at the end of my PowerPoint. Next slide, please. Um, one question that has come up in a lot of recent cases is whether the lump sum award includes future damages. That is, whether the jury's award should be seen as a fully paid up license or whether the patentee is entitled to ongoing royalties for sales after the date of the verdict. Ongoing royalties are a form of equitable relief and they are within the district court's discretion. If the district court determines that the plaintiff has not been compensated for the defendant's continuing infringement by the jury's verdict, then the court should award an ongoing royalty for post-verdict sales. But where the jury award clearly compensates the plaintiff for both past and future infringement through the life of the patent, the district court should not award additional damages. Um, this issue often arises and has ar arisen in a lot of recent district court cases where the verdict sheet is insufficient to indicate the basis of the jury's award or when the jury's verdict is a compromise so that it's difficult to say which expert's theory the jury adopted. For example, there may be a case where the defendant advocates a lump sum, the plaintiff advocates a running royalty, and then the jury awards a lump sum which exceeds the defendant's lump sum calculation, but is more consistent with financially with the plaintiff's per unit royalty. In these situations, the district court needs to decide whether the jury intended the award to compensate the patent owner through the life of the patent or only for damages incurred up to the time of trial. For example, in the Summit 6 case, the Federal Circuit um, addressed a verdict form that was ambiguous and neither party had proposed the jury's exact award. The court stated that where it is unclear where the jury based its award on a lump sum paid up license, running royalty, some variation or combination of the two, the district court has discretion in interpreting the jury verdict form. And this analysis depends a lot on the proof that the parties put in, for example, whether both parties limited their damages theories to past infringement or whether one or more of the parties based its damages on a paid up license. The court cannot assume that a lump sum award is for a fully paid up license. In Summit, both experts testified that a lump sum was either appropriate or could be used to compensate Summit through the life of the patent. The jury returned a verdict with a dollar amount and lump sum written on the verdict form. And here the Federal Circuit held that the district court didn't abuse its discretion in determining that the lump sum compensated the plaintiff for both past and future infringement in declining to award an ongoing royalty. In the Kaafi case, the district court granted an ongoing royalty because the jury verdict indicated that the reasonable royalty was a running royalty rather than a lump sum. And this decision shows the advantage of having a more detailed verdict form, particularly if the parties are using different theories. Um, other cases besides those cited here have had to undertake a more factual analysis of what proof was presented to the jury and in effect guess as to what the jury intended. Next slide. Another recent issue that comes up in reasonable royalty decisions is whether an ongoing royalty awarded after the verdict is required to be the same implied or explicit rate found by the jury or whether the award should be adjusted based on post-verdict circumstances. And I'd like to note here that a post-verdict royalty is generally based on the assumption that the royalty rate was negotiated and concluded at the time of the verdict. So it's not simply a continuation of the original hypothetical negotiation that is concluded at the time of the infringement. In the Amato case, Microsoft argued that the district court could only award what the jury found to be a reasonable royalty and no more. The Federal Circuit held that the jury's award per unit was based on Microsoft's infringing conduct that took place prior to the verdict and that there's a fundamental difference between a reasonable royalty for pre-verdict infringement and a reasonable royalty for post-verdict infringement. Prior to judgment, 
liability for infringement and validity of the patents are both uncertain and damages are determined in the context of that uncertainty. Once the patents are found valid and infringed by the jury, however, the calculus is different. In the Amato case, Microsoft was enjoined from further fringing activity, but was permitted to continue only by virtue of the court-ordered stay pending appeal. And I would note that some later cases, including cases cited on this slide, have limited Amato to cases where an injunction was stayed and the defendant is infringing after the verdict. The Federal Circuit did subsequently apply a motto in determining an ongoing royalty rate during a sunset period during which the injunction was stayed. That Federal Circuit case, Active Video Networks from 2012, um, involved the situation where the defendant argued that the royalty rate should be limited to a rate that the plaintiff had negotiated with a different party prior to the litigation. The Federal Circuit explained that the pre-litigation royalty rate was not applicable to the post-verdict calculation of the royalty rate between the parties in light of the substantial changes in their bargaining position following the jury's findings that the patent was infringed and not invalid. Now, despite two Federal Circuit cases discussing the issue, the law still appears to be unclear. In the Europep case from the Eastern District of Texas, Europe have asked the court to increase the royalty rate more than fivefold and award a 15% royalty rate for all infringing sales during the post-verdict period. Europe have, however, was not a competitor to the infringer and had not asked for a post-trial injunction. And the Eastern District of Texas noted that there were suggestions in the Federal Circuit law that a motto was not limited to the context in which an injunction was sought the Eastern Te District of Texas still distinguished Amato, noting that the royalty awarded by the jury was based on a hypothetical negotiation, which by definition assumes that the patent is valid and infringed. And the jury, when it finds the patent valid and infringed and awards a reasonable royalty, is just confirming what's an inherent part of the hypothetical negotiation. The circumstances bearing on the Amato analysis don't themselves compel a departure from the jury determined royalty rate. In other words, this court is saying that you don't get a higher royalty rate simply because the jury has determined infringement and validity in your favor. The Eastern District of Texas still found it appropriate to adopt a, a rate higher than the jury's royalty rate upon a persuasive showing that circumstances surrounding the hypothetical negotiation changed or perceived likely to change at the time of the jury's verdict. In Europep, the defendant's profit margin had increased during the pretrial period and could be expected to increase further during the post-verdict period and supported the plaintiff's contention that a hypothetical negotiation at the time of the verdict would have resulted in an agreement on a higher royalty rate than the rate found by the jury, which was based on a hypothetical negotiation taking place a few years earlier in 2014. So in other words, when you're addressing a post-verdict royalty, you're simply performing another reasonable royalty analysis, and upward deviation is warranted not on the fact of the verdict, but whether circumstances have changed between the first infringement and the time of the verdict. In the EMC case out of Delaware, the court noted, as I noted here, that the law in the area of ongoing royalty rates has not been definitively settled by the Federal Circuit. Similar to the Europep case, the court here, in assessing prospective damages for ongoing infringement, took into account the change in the party's bargaining positions that resulted from the determination of liability, but looked primarily to the purported changes in bargaining position and economic circumstances due to the passage of time. The, patent, the plaintiff argued, in addition to the fact that the jury had found its patents valid and infringed, that the defendant had experienced great economic success since 2011, the date of the original hypothetical negotiation. The court did not find the plaintiff's evidence of changed economic circumstances to be persuasive and did not award an increased royalty rate. In the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation case, the plaintiff sought an ongoing royalty of three times the jury's implied rate per unit. 
Although some of its response was stricken as improper, the plaintiff focused on the changed circumstances post-verdict and also argued that Apple's willful infringement supported an increased post-verdict royalty rate. The court dismissed the defendant's argument that the court should simply award the rate awarded by the jury as a non-starter. Unlike the courts in Europep and EMC, the court here found Amato persuasive on the issue of ongoing royalties. The court here started with the royalty awarded by the jury and then considered changes in the party's bargaining positions since the first infringement. The court found that the jury's finding of infringement bolstered the plaintiff's bargaining position in the hypothetical negotiation and put the plaintiff in a better position to demand a greater percentage of the defendant's profits than awarded by the jury. In light of that improved bargaining position, the court awarded a higher ongoing royalty rate. Both the Wisconsin Alumni Foundation and the EMC Corporation cases have been appealed to the Federal Circuit, so we may be getting some guidance on this issue next year. Next slide, please. The Federal Circuit has approved four types of reasonable royalty approaches, including the established royalty, hypothetical negotiation, which is the most commonly used method that relies on the Georgia-Pacific factors, the analytical approach, and the cost approach. Further, the court has disapproved the use of the rule of thumb and the Nash bargaining solution. These aren't reasonable royalty approaches per se, but are ways to allocate profit in the hypothetical negotiation. The Federal Circuit has vacated damages awards based on reasonable royalty calculations that used in part the Nash bargaining solution and the 25% rule of thumb. But recently, the Federal Circuit's position seems to have relaxed a bit. Next slide, please. The first type of royalty calculation is an established royalty, which is based on the first Georgia Pacific factor, which looks at the royalties received by the patentee for the licensing of the patent in suit, proving or tending to prove an established royalty. This type of royalty is normally applicable where the patent owner has consistently licensed others to engage in conduct at a uniform royalty. The main criteria for this type of royalty is acceptance by a sufficient number of licensees to show that the royalty amount or percentage is generally accepted. Next slide, please. Okay, as I noted, um, the primary factor is the number of royalty agreements. You need to have a sufficient number to show acquiescence in the industry to your licensing scheme. Um, you need to have royalty rates that are substantially uniform, but that does not mean that all the licenses need to have the same rate. For example, if you have one royalty rate for smaller companies and another royalty rate for larger companies or different royalties for licensees in different markets, the license rates can still be substantially uniform for purposes of an established royalty. But you would need to have a greater number of licenses and other proof to show that you consistently use those categories. You also need to show that the commercial relationship between the infringer and the patent owner is comparable to the facts surrounding prior royalty agreements. For example, to show that a license does not create or tend to prove an established royalty, the patentee can demonstrate that it does not license competitors so that its standard royalty rate is based on a situation, i.e. licenses of non-competitors, that is not comparable and that the royalty rate should not apply. Also, it is very helpful if the patent owner has a formal licensing program with documented criteria which proves how the royalty rate is applied in what situations. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not going to discuss the hypothetical negotiation analysis in depth because Lauren is going to discuss the topic in more depth in her presentation. What I'm going to go through here are Federal Circuit decisions related to the hypothetical negotiation. Starting with the RescueNet case in 2010, the admission of settlement agreements has been a hot and admittedly unclear topic. There were two Federal Circuit cases this year regarding admission of settlement agreements. The holdings of prison technologies are somewhat limited because the defendant did not raise some of the arguments on appeal and therefore waived them. The defendant only raised Rule 403 below and did not raise the issue of a categorical bar or a bar under Rule 48 at the district court. The Federal Circuit still addressed these issues despite the waiver. The Federal Circuit affirmed that there is no categorical bar against admission of licenses entered into for settlement and that courts should use the rebalancing 
analysis. Also, the Federal Circuit stated in dicta that the Rule 408 bar on the admission of settlement agreements does not categorically bar admission of settlement agreements as a proof of a reasonable royalty. The Federal Circuit also addressed the admission of a settlement agreement in the Rembrandt Wireless case. The Federal Court held that the District Court didn't abuse its discretion in allowing the expert to discuss the settlement agreement because it was relevant. The Federal Circuit reiterated that relevant settlement agreements can be considered in determining a reasonable royalty rate. And as I noted, Lauren is going to discuss this topic in more depth later. Next slide, please. An important point in the hypothetical negotiation is that profitability, either the patentee's profitability or the infringer's profitability, can serve as a basis for a reasonable royalty, particularly where the parties are competitors. While the patent owner may not be entitled to lost profits for various reasons, such as not satisfying the Panduit factors, the patent owner can attempt to capture some of that lost profit in the context of a reasonable royalty. In the Asetek Denmark case, the royalty calculation relied in large part on the patentee's own profit margin. The patentee basically said, why would I license a competitor for less than I make licensing to a customer? And the Federal Circuit found that to be a rational argument. Notably, the plaintiff's expert addressed all of the factors in the Georgia Pacific analysis, and the fact that the patent owner's profits figured prominently in that analysis did not mean that the damages analysis was insufficient or that expert testimony needed to be excluded. Um, obviously, this argument may not apply to every case. For example, if you are not licensing competitors in the hypothetical negotiation, your profits may not be as big a factor in the calculus of what you would license your patent for. In the AstraZeneca case, the reasonable royalty was 50% of the defendant's profits that it made in selling the infringing product. So here, competition was used to justify a quite, quite high royalty. Astra would not have accepted a low royalty rate because if Apotex entered into the market, it would cause a decline in the price of Astra's own product and a related product. I would note that even the large royalty left Apotex with a profit margin similar to the margin it made on other products. Again, you can use expected profits to support a reasonable royalty calculation, but you need to tie that evidence to the circumstances of the case. For example, if you would be licensing a competitor as a result of the hypothetical negotiation, what effect does it have on the patent owner's profits? Have an economist or other damages expert look into all the facts and detail those facts in the expert report regarding the effect of infringement on your own products. Next slide, please. Lauren is going to discuss comparable licenses in more detail in her presentation, but here are um, recent cases on this issue. This slide shows that comparable licenses, as I discussed before, can govern or dictate the form of the damages calculation, lump sum or running royalty. Further, it is well established that comparable licenses are reliable, perhaps the most accepted method of establishing a reasonable royalty. Next slide, please. The Federal Circuit has set forth general standards of admissibility of license agreements entered into as a result of settlement. Before admitting such evidence, the court must determine whether the license meets a minimum threshold of comparability. The standard is whether the license is sufficiently related to the case at hand. In assessing comparability, the litigants and the court must account for technological and economic differences in third-party licenses and loose or vague comparability between different technologies or licenses is insufficient. There really is a blurry line between what the courts consider admissible and what is simply fodder for cross-examination. Next slide, please. There hasn't been a lot of recent Federal Circuit discussion on the issue, but apportionment is still a common topic in damages, particularly at the district court level. Accused infringers often argue for dismissal of a damages case or to exclude expert testimony based on lack of apportionment. Apportionment is the idea that you're not supposed to be awarded royalties on unpatented features and that the patentee needs to limit its royalty base to the benefits of the patented features. In some instances, you can base the royalties on the smallest patent practicing unit, for example, a patented spoon 
which in most instances is in a multi-component device. Usually the claims would cover the entire spoon, so you could make an argument that the smallest saleable unit is a spoon and the royalty base should be based on that sales price. Defendants will still argue that you should apportion the value of the patented features from the unpatented features based on current case law. Although in some instances that argument may go a bit too far because clearly something like a spoon is a unitary product and you should be able to use the whole spoon as a royalty base, you should anticipate that argument and have alternative damages bases ready. As noted on this slide, the courts also consider the entire market value rule where the patented feature creates the basis of the demand for the product. Demonstrating that demand can be accomplished through lay testimony showing demand for the patented feature, marketing materials, expert testimony, and surveys. Next slide, please. Um, as I noted before, the Federal Circuit hasn't really issued gener general pronouncements on apportionment in the past year, but in the Rembrandt Wireless case, it affirmed the non-exclusion of expert testimony that had effectively apportioned damages by comparing the prices of Bluetooth chips with the infringing technology and chips without to determine the incremental value of the patented technology. There was a price difference between the two different models that was the incremental profit or revenue. The infringer's complaints about the time period for the sales used and the attribution of the price differential solely to the infringing technology were dismissed by the Federal Circuit as going to the weight, not the admissibility of the testimony. Technical expert testimony was used to show that the addition of the infringing technology was the primary difference between the chips used for the comparison. The damages expert also stated sound reasons for attributing the price differential solely to the infringing technology. Another case, which is a little older, the Summit case, relied on a use survey which demonstrated how many people actually used the infringing feature and the reasonable royalty was based on the portion of the revenue attributable to the percentage of use of the feature. And here again, the Federal Circuit emphasized that flaws in the data or factual assumptions go to the weight, not the admissibility of the evidence. Next slide. Another methodology approved by the Federal Circuit and recently addressed in a 2017 case is the cost approach. Basically, this is a hypothetical license that is based on consideration of the cost and availability of non-infringing alternatives. In the PRISM Technologies case, the Federal Circuit in effect indicated that this approach satisfied apportionment issues, stating that the requirement for valuing the patented technology can be met if the patentee shows that the infringement allowed the infringer to avoid taking a different and more costly course of action. The royalty in PRISM was based on estimated costs that Sprint avoided by infringing and was based on evidence that the reasonable royalty reflected Sprint's willingness to pay certain costs in order to provide its customers with the kind of service it wanted to offer. Sprint would have had to build a private backhaul network instead of leasing backhaul services from third-party providers to avoid infringement. The damages were based on the difference between Sprint's building costs and leasing costs. The defendant argued that the approach was insufficiently tied to the footprint of the invention because PRISM did not invent backhaul networks. Although a patentee has to tie proof of damages to the claimed invention's footprint in the marketplace, the Federal Circuit said that requirement can be met if the patentee shows that the defendant's infringement allowed it to avoid taking a different course of action. The patent owner's experts, including a technical expert, testified that in the absence of a license, Sprint would have had to attempt to design around the patented invention by building its own private backhaul network. In the Powell case, the cost savings were shown to be the cost of using another method of protecting the saw and a reduction of accident costs at the defendant's stores. Next slide, please. The analytic approach is not used as quite often as others, but it is a method that tries to isolate the profit gained by the infringement. That is often the difference between the infringer's usual net profit and its profit on the infringing device, which is the so-called excess profit. Next slide, please. 
In using this approach, there have been instances where litigants have successfully compared the expected margin on the infringing products with the industry standard profit margin. For example, if the infringer sells a phone with a standard profit margin of 20 and it sells the infringing phone at a 30% profit margin, the 10% differential can serve as a basis for reasonable royalty. The method can also be based on a comparison between the profit margin on an infringing product and the profit margin on a non-infringing product. Lauren is going to explain additional ways of using this method later in her presentation. Next slide, please. Using the analytical method requires the patent owner to show the nature of the technology and the degree to which the claimed patent represents an actual advance in the art. The owner needs to show the degree to which the improvement claimed in the patent generated an incremental or discernible portion of the profit the defendant has earned. The method also needs to take into account the defendant's actual use of the patented technology. Next slide. The question here is whether this method inherently satisfies the apportionment requirement. And I believe that yes, this method satisfies the apportionment concerns elucidated by the Federal Circuit. The caveat is that the patent owner will not in every case have an obvious method to prove the incremental profit actually attributable to the claimed invention. There can be a lot of economic variables, and in many situations, you are not going to have the infringer selling phone A with no infringing features, and then substantially identical phone B with the only difference being the addition of the infringing feature. That's why, although this method seems tailor-made to satisfy current Federal Circuit damages guidelines, it does not appear in court decisions as often as the hypothetical negotiation. Lauren will explain additional ways of using this method later in her presentation, as I noted before. Next slide. Basically, a sticky issue in the hypothetical negotiation is how do you allocate the benefits of the technology? If you are able to show an economic benefit gained by utilizing the patented features, how do you split that benefit between the parties? Unless it's a really strange situation, one party is not going to get all the profit and the other party zero. You're going to have to come to a split, and the question is how do you do that? You can't use the rule of thumb to allocate 25% of the profits from the sale of the device as a royalty. That has been rejected by the Federal Circuit. It's not as clear you can't use the Nash bargaining solution, but so far the Federal Circuit rejected its use in a case where it was not tied to the facts of the case and warn that anyone trying to use it needs to establish a fit between the facts and the theorem, which um, it's hard to prove because, for example, it assumes that both parties have knowledge of the others or complete knowledge of the other's positions, which is usually not the case. Recently, however, litigants, litigants have sort of returned to an arbitrary split of the profits, but this time giving substantial reasons for the split and tethering it to the facts of the case. In Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, the experts isolated the benefits attributable to the patented invention, and then based on a conversation with the plaintiff's managing director, its history of licensing and negotiation, and the nature of the technology, the plaintiff's expert opined that the foundation would have sought 50 to 70% of the incremental additional profits that Apple realized. The court held the split admissible because it was tied to the facts of the case. In Summit 6, the Federal Circuit accepted a 50-50 split. The incremental profit was based on a percentage of revenue realized from the infringing cell phones, which was based on the percentage of users that used the infringing feature. Plaintiff's expert allocated the incremental revenue 50-50 based on several factors, including that Samsung had no infringing alternatives and neither party had a stronger negotiating position. The damages expert cited three academic articles and the Nash bargaining solution to support his theory of an even split. The Federal Circuit noted on appeal that defendants didn't challenge the use of the Nash bargaining solution, so this case doesn't bless the use of the theory in general. Next slide. My final topic is the use of surveys and the damages analysis. In doing apportionment of revenue, either in terms of calculating an incremental profit or apportioning damages, litigants have used surveys. Consumer survey evidence can demonstrate the evidentiary link between the patented invention and consumer demand. Usage surveys and conjoint analysis have been approved by the Federal Circuit. A usage survey will determine, for example, 
if you have a phone and there is a specific zoom feature on the camera, how many people buy the phone, then how many people use the camera in the phone, and of these people, how many use the patented zoom feature. If you figure out that 20% of the people use the infringing feature, you can come up with a value for it. That was the Summit 6 case, and the Federal Circuit held it was not an abuse of discretion to admit surveys and to allow experts to rely on them. A conjoint analysis is, in essence, the value the customer would be willing to pay for or how customers value a particular characteristic of a device. This analysis is a consumer survey or based on a consumer survey, and it can be ranking-based or choice-based. A ranking-based conjoint analysis allows ranking of products within a group, whereas choice-based presents groups of products to choose. Both analyses result in a relative comparison of com consumer preferences for product features and combinations. <clears throat> a ranking-based conjoint analysis has the expert identify product attributes, conduct a survey where the respondents rank the importance of specific attributes or products, and analyze the data using statistical analysis to determine the relationship between rankings and attributes. Then a simulation is conducted in which the results of the data analysis determines the additional value of the target attributes. The choice-based conjoint analysis is similar. The expert identifies product attributes, conducts a survey where the respondents choose among products with different combinations of different attributes, and analyzes the data using statistical analyses. The expert then conducts a simulation in which the results determine the additional value of the target attribute. For example, in Apple versus Samsung, there was a choice-based conjoint model where the respondents chose which of four hypothetical smartphones they preferred. These analyses are generally admissible if they are done properly. In finishing up here, a regression analysis can be a price premium analysis. It is a set of statistical techniques that uses data to determine the relationship between a dependent variable, such as product price, and an independent variable, for example, product features. It's useful in determining whether the value of a patented feature drives the price or profitability and what its value is. Notably, testimony regarding such an analysis has been excluded by the Federal Circuit, but not because the method itself was faulty, but because it was based on arbitrary assumptions that had no basis in the facts of the case. In the Wisconsin Alumni Foundation case, the regression analysis resulted in a dollar value associated with the change in speed of the processors used in the accused Apple products, an estimate of a 9% reduction of processor speed if Apple did not use the infringing technology. That reduction in processor speed would decrease the average prices of the accused iPhones and iPads by a certain percentage. The district court held that the testimony using the analysis was admissible and upheld the use of that analysis on post-trial motions. On the appeal to the Federal Circuit, which has been briefed, the defendant is arguing that the analysis and related testimony should have been excluded. That concludes my presentation, and I'm going to hand it back to David. All right. Thank you very much.